If we're transitioning our network from IP version 4 to IP version 6, that upgrade is probably not going to be a forklift upgrade where we upgrade everything overnight. It's going to be a process. The good news is we've got several mechanisms that can help us make that transition. One tool that we have is called Dual Stack. That's where we can go and add IP version 6 addressing to IP version 4 hosts on the network assuming that they support IP version 6. Or maybe we have a situation like we see at the bottom of the screen. We've got a couple of areas of the network that do support IP version 6. However, to get from one area to the other, we've got to go through an area that only supports IP version 4. Well, what we might do in a case like that is an IPv6 over an IPv4 tunnel, where we take IP version 6 packets and encapsulate them in IP version 4 tunnel packets that can help us span an IP version 4 only portion of the network. And another tool we can use on the topic of this week's video is called NAT64. Hi, my name is Kevin Wallace. I want to welcome you back to the channel. And in this week's video, we're going to be discussing how NAT64 can help us in this migration from IP version 4 to IP version 6. And where this really shines is it can help us communicate from a host that is IPv6 only to a host that is IPv4 only. It's not as great in the other direction going from IPv4 to IPv6. There's some support. I'll demonstrate that for you in a moment. But this is primarily going to help us out when we're going from an IPv6 only host to an IPv4 only host. And this is one of the mechanisms that we can use in tandem to help us migrate from IPv4 to IPv6. Now the challenge is an IP version 4 address is a 32-bit address. An IP version 6 address is a 128-bit address. So let's say that I'm sitting on a device that is IPv6 only, and I'm trying to communicate with a device that is IPv4 only. But since I only know about IPv6, I need to send that packet destined for a 128-bit IPv6 address. Well, what NAT or Network Address Translation 6.4 allows us to do is to prepend that 32-bit IPv4 address with 96 other bits. And we can define what those bits are, and I'll demonstrate how to do that for you in just a moment. But by default, we have these 96 bits that we can prepend to our IPv4 address. It's 64 colon FF9B colon colon slash 96. Those are the first 96 bits. We just add those on to the 96 bits making up our IPv4 address. And now we have a destination IPv6 address that represents that IPv4 only host. And oftentimes when we use NAT64, it's going to be in combination with a DNS64 server which can take an A record, and that gives us the IPv4 address of a fully qualified domain name. And this DNS64 server can dynamically generate a 128-bit address. It can stick on those 96 bits for us and create dynamically a quad A record or an AAAA record. That gives us the IPv6 address for a fully qualified domain name. Let's go through an example. Let's say that this PC only supports IP version 6 and we see its IPv6 address. It's 2001-1-A-64. And it wants to communicate with server.kwtrain.com, and we'll say that that only has an IP version 4 address, 192.168.1.10-24. But our PC does not need to be concerned about that. It can send out a DNS query saying, hey, what is the IPv6 address of server.kwtrain.com? And our DNS64 server looks and says, well, I only have an A record. I've only got information about its IP version 4 address. But because we're a DNS64 server, we can dynamically add those extra 96 bits to generate a quad A record. Now let's take the 32-bit IPv4 address and break it down into its 32 bits. 192.168.1.10, that is in dotted decimal notation. We've got four bytes separated by dots. And if we take a byte and divide it into two four-bit sections, those four-bit sections are called nibbles. There are two nibbles in a byte. And a nibble can be represented as a hexadecimal value because four bits give us 16 possible values. And if we take these 32 bits and break them down into these eight nibbles and convert each nibble to a corresponding hex digit, this is what we have. And then we can prepend to these 32 bits our 96-bit global stateful prefix. And if we don't otherwise specify one, the default is going to be 64 colon FF 9B colon colon slash 96. 
And by prepending that to our IP version 4 address, that gives us a 128-bit IP version 6 address that our DNS 6.4 server can dynamically add in a quad A record. And it's going to respond to the PC and say, yeah, the IPv6 address of server.kwtrain.com is 64 colon FF 9B colon colon C0 A8 colon 10A. So when the PC sends the packet into the NAT64 router, its source address is going to be itself, but this quad A record value that we dynamically constructed, that's going to be the destination. And then our NAT64 router does the job of NAT, network address translation, and it translates our source IPv6 address into a corresponding IPv4 address that represents, in this case, the PC. And we can specify that IP version 4 address as part of our NAT64 configuration that I'm going to demonstrate for you in just a moment. Then, after we do this mapping, which could be a static mapping or it could be a dynamic mapping, and I'll show you how to configure it both ways. Let's say that we've converted 2001 colon 1 colon colon A. We've converted that into 10.10.10.10. And that's going to be our source IPv4 address coming from router R1 going to the server destined for 192.168.1.10. And then the return traffic from server.kwtrain.com is simply going to transpose those source and destination addresses that we had a moment ago. And that's how we can communicate between an IPv6 only host and an IPv4 only host. Now let's go out to a live interface and I want to show you how to configure this. And by the way, down in the description of this video, I've included a link where you can download a PDF containing a topology diagram that we're going to be using as well as the base configurations of the routers. So if you want to do this on your own, you can download this PDF and apply those base configurations to your gear. And after that, that PDF gives you a complete walkthrough script of today's demonstration so you don't have to take time at jotting down commands as we go through the demonstration. You can just download that PDF and again, the link is available in the description of this video. Now let's go out to a live interface and configure NAT64. In this topology, router R1 only has an IP version 6 address and router R3, it only has an IP version 4 address. But router R2 has both. That's going to be our NAT64 router. Specifically, R2 has an IPv6 address on gig 0 slash 0, and it has an IPv4 address on gig 0 slash 1. What we want to do in this demonstration is configure NAT64 on router R2 such that R1 is going to be able to ping R3. And to begin, let's enable NAT64 on both of our interfaces on router R2. We'll go into global configuration mode, and in interface gig 0 slash 0, we'll say NAT64 enable. Let's do the same thing for gig 0 slash 1. Again, we'll say NAT64 enable. And we're done enabling NAT64 on our interfaces. And when we're going from IPv6 to IPv4, we're going from a 128-bit address to a 32-bit address. So we need to have a 96-bit prefix and the remaining 32 bits. Those will be the 32 bits of our IPv4 address. And just by enabling NAT64, as we've already done, we already have a well-known 96-bit prefix that we can use. And we can view that with the command show NAT64 prefix stateful global. And here is that prefix that we talked about earlier that we have by default. However, something to be aware of is that this well-known prefix will only work on our local network, not on the public internet. So what if we want to use a globally unique prefix that can be routed on the internet? Here's how we do that. Let's go back into global configuration mode and we'll say NAT64 prefix stateful, and we can give a global unique prefix that we have that's been assigned to us. And let's just pretend that we're working with a global unique prefix of 2001 colon a colon colon slash 96. Let's enter that. And if we once again look at our stateful global prefixes, we'll see that we now have this prefix that we have defined. Now let's configure NAT64 to actually do the network address translation from IPv6 to IPv4. One approach is to do a static mapping. For example, let's say that an IPv4 address of 10.10.10.10 that will be translated into our IPv6 address of 2001 colon 1 colon colon A. 
And that's the IPv6 address of router R1. Let's go back into global configuration mode and set up that static mapping. To do that, we say NAT 64 v6 v4 because we're specifying a mapping going from IP version 6 to IP version 4. We're going to make it a static mapping and we're going to map the IPv6 address of 2001 colon 1 colon colon A. We're going to map that, which is R1, to this 10.10.10.10 IPv4 address. Let's end that. Need to press enter and then we'll end that. And we can see our translations by saying show nat 64 translations. And we see that this IPv6 address is going to be represented with this IPv4 address. And to test this, let's ping 10.10.10.10 from R3 and see if we're able to reach R1. But before we do that, let's go to R1 and do a debug. Let's debug IPv6 ICMP packets, which are going to be IPv6 ping packets. And I want to make sure that this will show up on the screen, so I'll say logging console. And let's go to R3 and do a ping. Let's ping 10.10.10.10. The ping is successful, and if we go over to R1, let me do a U all to turn off the debugging, and we see that we received an echo request from a source of 2001 colon A colon colon. That, by the way, that's the prefix that we defined. And the remainder of this source IPv6 address of C08810A, that represents the 32 bits of R3's IPv4 address, 192.168.1.10. And if you want to take time to go through the binary and hexadecimal math that we did earlier, you'll see that C08810A, if we convert each of those hex digits into a nibble and we combine groups of two nibbles, then we're going to have an IPv4 address of 192.168.1.10. And from the perspective of R1, let's make sure that we can ping that address. Let me do a copy and I'll say ping and I'll paste in that address. And that is also successful. Now in this demo, we're pinging IPv4 and IPv6 addresses, but in the real world, we're probably pointing to fully qualified domain names. That's where the DNS 6.4 server is going to help us out. But here, we're just going to use the addresses. And in the example we just did, we used a static mapping and it was bidirectional. There is a way to do dynamic mapping, but it's not bidirectional. The reason is, if we're on an IPv6 client, we can specify a full IPv6 address to represent an IPv4 destination simply by prepending that 96-bit global prefix. However, if I'm on an IPv4 client, unless there is some sort of a mapping already in place, we don't have an IPv4 address to point to in order to get to an IPv6 address, unless we have a static mapping or unless a dynamic session was already set up. But if our sessions are always going to be sourced from IPv6 clients, which might be, for example, trying to reach a group of IP version 4 servers, then a dynamic approach, that might be useful. Let's see how to set up dynamic NAT64. To begin with, let's go back to R2 and let's get rid of our existing mapping. Let's go back into global configuration mode and I'll find our mapping and negate that by putting a no in front of it. And now let's create an access control list that matches all IPv6 addresses that begin with 2001 colon 1 colon colon slash 64. And I'll name that ACL version 6 in all uppercase. And just a personal preference, when I'm working in uh, Cisco IOS and I'm naming something like an ACL, I like to use all uppercase so I know that when I'm looking through the config and I see version 6 and all uppercase, I know that's not some sort of a special Cisco IOS keyword. It's a name that I came up with. So let's say IPv6 access hyphen list. And I'm going to give it a name of version 6. And I want to permit, which in this context means I want to match, a prefix of 2001 colon 1 colon colon slash 64. Oh, and that should be going to a destination of any. I don't care where it's going. I'm just concerned with matching that source. Now let's create a pool of IP version 4 addresses which can be mapped to our IPv6 addresses. And I'll name that pool of addresses v4pool. Here's how we create that pool. I'll say nat 
64v4 pool. Let's create a pool of IP version 4 addresses that's going to be named v4 pool. And that pool is going to start at 10.10.10.1 and go all the way through 10.10.10.254. And now that we have our access list and we have our pool, let's tie those together. Let's set up our dynamic mapping. To do that, we'll say NAT64 going from version 6 to version 4, just like we did with our static mapping. But instead of doing a static mapping this time, my IP version 6 address is going to be matching an access list called version 6. And it's going to be translated into an IP version 4 address that came from a pool of IP version 4 addresses that was named v4 pool. And we're done with our configuration. Now at this point, I could not go to R3 and ping R1 because there's no IPv4 address associated with R1's IPv6 address. However, I can go to R1 and ping R3 by prepending R3's 32-bit address with our 96-bit global prefix that we've already defined. Let's do that. Let's go to R1. And we'll say ping, and it's the same address that we used earlier, 2001 colon A colon colon C0 A8 colon 10A. That is successful. And if we go to router R2 and look at our translations by saying show NAT64 translations, we can see that we've made that dynamic mapping. And at this point, we do have a session set up. So temporarily, before this session times out, I can go to R3 and I should be able to ping, let's see what we were translated into, 10.10.10.1. We can ping 10.10.10.1 as long as that session remains up. Once it times out, then I cannot initiate a session, ping or otherwise, from router R3 going over to R1. And that's a look at the configuration of NAT64, which can help us communicate between a host speaking only IPv6 and a host speaking only IPv4.